Lincoln's speeches, his letters, his documents are quoted by some of the great statesmen, presidents, politicians, and certainly by teachers. In fact, if you look at the lower right corner, 10 days ago, the Dalai Lama, receiving an honorary degree at the University of Arkansas, paraphrased from the Gettysburg Address, government by the people for the people is the best way to govern. On the night of his presidential victory, President Barack Obama quoted from Abraham Lincoln's first inaugural address, we are not enemies but friends. Though passions may have strained, it must not break our bonds of affection. And in 1984, on the beaches at Normandy, Ronald Reagan spoke about Abraham Lincoln as well. Lincoln reminded us that through their deeds, the dead of battle have spoken more eloquently for themselves than any of the living could ever do. But we can only honor them by rededicating ourselves to the cause for which they gave that last full measure of devotion. Again, the tail end of that quote is from the Gettysburg Address. One of my favorite quotes comes from the great American historian Bernard DeVoto. DeVoto, I've used this quote for 40 years in presentations. The Civil War is the crux of our history. You cannot understand any part of our past from the convening of the Continental Convention down to this morning without arriving at the Civil War. Today, let us begin our very quick journey of about 40, 45 minutes together at Appomattox. Four years of bloody fratricidal war had come to a conclusion. In the McLean House at Appomattox Courthouse, Robert E. Lee met with the victorious General Ulysses Simpson Grant. A document was drafted. They signed that document, which brought peace once again to our country. It is true there were some other armies, Confederate armies in the field, but it was the largest Confederate army that surrendered at Appomattox and essentially brings this war to a conclusion. Now that was the official part of it, but three days later at Appomattox, a Union general by the name of Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain was given the responsibility of conducting the military surrender of the Confederate Army. Chamberlain wrote a book, a very famous book, he's, he's quite an intellectual man, was a university professor, governor of the state of Maine, he's one of the heroes of the Battle of Gettysburg. But Chamberlain was in charge of the surrender and he said that morning he noticed as the Confederates were forming up and began to march up into Appomattox that their heads were down, tears coming down their cheeks, they were not in a military formation. Uh, they, were, they knew they had lost. They had lost the war. They were still formed by companies and regiments and brigades. But that, that feeling of being the great soldier of the Confederacy wasn't with them anymore. And so in Chamberlain's book, The Passing of the Armies, he writes an eloquent chapter about the surrender. And there's a brief quote here. Standing before us now, imagine Chamberlain. You're with him and these Confederate troops come marching up into the community. Standing before us now, thin, worn, and famished, but erect, waking memories that bound us together as no other bond, was not such manhood to be welcomed back into a union so tested and so assured? The Confederate general in charge of the surrender was from the state of Georgia, John Brown Gordon, a major general, Gordon was leading his troops up into, the, into Appomattox where they would lay down their, their rifles and the accoutrements of war and they would furl their battle flags. And Chamberlain continued his, his writing when he said, Our bugle sounds the signal and instantly our whole line, regiment by regiment, gives the soldiers salutation. From the order arms to the old carry, the marching salute. Gordon wheels superbly making with himself and his horse one uplifted figure. He drops the point of his sword to the boot toe, and honor answers honor. The significance of that is rather amazing. In all of military history, throughout all of world history, you never, never will see the victor saluting the vanquished. And it happened here at Appomattox Courthouse on the 12th of April 
of 1865. As those Confederate soldiers marched up into the town, the orders were barked out by Chamberlain, and those Union soldiers snapped too. They brought their rifles up, and they rendered the old rifle salute. The victor saluting the vanquished. It's unheard of. When Gordon heard that, those orders barked out by Chamberlain, and he saw what the Union troops were doing down the line, Chamberlain would render his salute, and Gordon would do likewise with that sword to the, boot of his, uh, to the toe of his boot. And he turned, uh, Gordon turned on his horse. He barked the orders to his subordinate officers, and down that line, those Confederate soldiers suddenly came to attention, brought their heads up, their shoulders back, and they brought up their rifles as well. And they rendered that same salute back to the victors. This time, though, the vanquished was saluting the victor. I would submit to you that that is a moment in American history when the healing of that great conflict began. The soldiers on both sides agreeing that for the first time we were part of a United States of America. We were no longer a divided nation. We were part of the United States of America. That little incident on the fields at Appomattox was extremely important in the history of the United States of America. I would submit to you as well that when we think of the great Civil War figures and we think of this era, that there is no other period in American history that has produced more exciting or unforgettable personalities. I would submit that for color and drama, impact, intellect, devotion to duty, and the pursuit of great dreams, the list of Civil War participants seems endless. I won't mention the names of all of these folks because you could add another hundred, two hundred, a thousand names to it if you chose. But that era of history is amazing with the wonderful personalities created. Famous quotes from the Civil War abound with malice toward none, with charity for all. Abraham Lincoln's second inaugural is considered the greatest inaugural address any president has ever rendered in the United States. It is well that war is so terrible, else men would love, uh, learn to love it too much. Robert E. Lee said after the very bloody battle and repulse of the federal troops at Fredericksburg. Let us cross over the river and rest under the shade of the trees, said Thomas uh, Jonathan Stonewall Jackson just prior to laying his head on the pillow and closing his eyes and passing into eternity. The generals of the Civil War abound. There's almost 400 generals on either side. General Grant and General Sherman represented the North. Sherman marched through the state of Georgia and created a path that you can still follow to this day. He burned a path 300 miles long and 60 miles wide. I happen to be a Georgian and I have written material from my great-grandmother, an old lined paper where she talks about what those dastardly Yankees did when they came through our, our area. It's always been interesting to me that we know a lot about Robert E. Lee. We always praise Robert E. Lee, a great and glorious figure, but the man who won the war was Ulysses Simpson Grant. I think the greatest general in the Union Army, maybe the greatest general certainly produced in the American Civil War, is Grant and Stonewall Jackson, who was so great, especially in 1862 in the Shenandoah Valley. But the war abounds with great soldiers. It also abounds with women who've made fabulous contributions to that time period. They sacrificed as well as any man, be that man old or young. Clara, Clara Barton worked diligently during the Civil War with the United States Sanitary Commission. She is the founder of the American Red Cross in those years after the Civil War. Dorothea Dix founded the, uh, the nursing system for the United States military. The first and only woman ever to receive the Medal of Honor from our government was Dr. Mary Walker. And in this illustration or this photograph, you can see that medal that she is wearing proudly right here. That's the Civil War version of the Medal of Honor.